So if we're looking at differences coming with, between denominations and different interpretations of scripture, sometimes it's just going to be down to, well, who sees what where. And yes, I've been in discussions with people who saw things in scripture that definitely weren't there. Uh, you might have even encountered that yourself where they like insert words or they take away words and very, very odd. But even beyond this, there are different uh, factors leading into, well, how do you determine doctrine? How do you talk about doctrine? So the major influences would be, say, um, scripture itself. So what does the Bible say? How do we understand script, uh, the Bible and what place does it have? Uh, the next one would actually be tradition. So yes, scripture is God's word to us and we should be uh, recognizing how important it is. Um, but tradition has always kind of been there trying to interpret scripture. So what can we look into the history of the church to say, do we have to fight these battles over again or has the church father already reasoned the way through? And going through tradition can be extremely helpful, especially when we're trying to uh, address certain topics. So we don't necessarily have to hash out uh, the Trinity all over again because, well, we've had the Apostles' Creed and Nicene Creed for quite some time. Uh, and it's been very helpful that these uh, traditional positions articulating scripture are present within the church. But if we're looking at scripture and even at tradition, we also need to understand that there is some amount of reason involved, that you're using logic to actually say, does this mean this? Um, and that would also include the general principles of reading, <laughs> understanding language. Because if we're looking at scriptural text, well, is this figurative? Is this literal? Is this historical? What, what's going on here? And then we use a basic amount of reason and understanding of language to say this is what it is. So this is also influential inside the church. Uh, lastly, I'm going to put write this category as experiential. Uh, but this is very, very broad because when we're talking about things going on in the church, we can say, well, some people have had visions, some people have had dreams, uh, many, many different things going on. But if we're talking about experiences, this can also lead to, well, the general principle of what's worshiped, what's preached. That which is worshiped, it becomes that which is preached, what becomes preached becomes what is worshiped. So uh, if, if we're in worship and we're trying to <clears throat> uh, present the word of God in an honest way, we're going to be preaching what's in scripture. But if we're focusing on certain things in worship, that now becomes one of our focuses in, in, uh, uh, in, in doctrine. So if we're preaching salvation by grace through faith, upstairs, we're going to start worshiping with hymns and other psalms about uh, great being saved by grace through faith. And since we're singing about that, and that's within people's, well, right, right at the forefront of their mind when they're thinking about religion, because they're worshiping here every single week, or hopefully they're worshiping here every single week. With that in mind, that is now going to be their focus whenever they're going to start preaching the gospel. Like, what, what's What's uh, 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 faith about? Well, or sorry, what's the Christian faith about? Well, it's being about saved by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. And they have that through the hymns. And usually people remember the hymns better than long blocks of text that, that you try to memorize from scripture or the small catechism. So, um, yeah, what is worship? Because what is presented in worship becomes that which is preached. Mm -hmm. And what is preached becomes that which is uh, presented in worship. So experiential is a lot of, well, how do you worship? How do you have a regular devotional life? And what are you focusing on and why? So these four things, they're the ones that help us focus on, well, doctrine. And they help shape doctrine and how it's presented to us. But 
since these things are all kind of interrelated, uh, structure being what well, we would say the, the, the most important because this is the word of God. Your experiences might not necessarily be along the lines of the word of God. And you might even have experiences that are not along the word of God. A lot of people who feel, I don't know, ecstasy about raising up their hands in church and going, I felt really good at this moment. That's not necessarily the best indicator. Uh, you have to, as scripture says, you have to test the spirits. Is this thing that you experience really from God or is this just the happiness that you're experiencing? Is this purely emotional or is it something spiritual? Um, same type of thing with logic, reason logic, you can go way off the rails. Uh, same thing with tradition, you can go way off the rails. Uh, and I'll even say with scripture, some people have gone off the rails and I'll explain that. Because when we're actually looking at all these things, you get into a spectrum of Christian faith. So if we're looking at, uh, say, uh, disagreements within the church, Catholicism, and we would say would probably be over here. I'll just put RCC, Roman Catholic Church. And they would be way over there because they're emphasizing tradition, even as you would say, at the cost of scripture. So they're going, this is this is what the church has taught for a few hundred years, therefore we must preach it now. Um, and you can actually see within Roman Catholicism that there are doctrines that are accepted which were not preached in the early church. And then usually when they try to accept one of these doctrines, they scramble to try and find justification within the early church. And they're doing this until um, about the 1800s where you get uh, Newman, who presented basically a doctrinal creational uh, a hypothesis that the Roman Catholic Church, as the spirit constantly moving and changing individuals, that you can actually create new doctrine. Mm -hmm. And now it's now that's debated within the Roman Catholic Church. You actually have to find something in the age of the apostles to kind of count as a doctrine in the present day, or can you just have a new doctrine? Uh, most people say, no, we can't have a new doctrine, but every once in a while somebody has. Like, and that would be more of the very progressive people within the Roman Catholic Church, the people who now want to have uh, um, female priests or, or uh, homosexuality or basically ordained by the church. A uh, little bit closer to the center, you would actually have the Eastern Orthodox Church because they're still holding the tradition very, very high, and sometimes they will actually just read scripture through a tradition, and they might, as I would uh, and not analyze it, they're not reading it as honestly as they could because they're reading it through the scope of tradition. Mm -hmm. But uh, they do have tradition in tension with scripture. Now, what these churches will actually promote and what they have in their confessional documents is that the two sources of their doctrine are scripture and tradition on equal planes. But usually, usually doctrine, sorry, tradition uh, predominates. Now, uh, if we're going to say the other way, if you're going to reason, so not necessarily tradition, but you're going to, does this make sense to me? You're going to get Calvinism. So, Actually, maybe I'll put that a little bit further in. The actual Calvin Calvinism. <laughs> um, yeah, they're, they're usually holding scripture very highly, but since they're trying to talk about reason so much, they're saying, well, this doesn't make sense to me, so therefore I can't say that. Um, but I would put Calvinism kind of closer here because John Calvin, uh, even though he does influence or uses reason too much as an influence in certain respects, he does recognize that there is salvation offered in the in baptism of the Lord's Supper. But when you get to uh, further along here, I'll, I'll just put reformed, and that's a very, very broad category. 
But um, other Reformed churches will just say, well, no, this is too spiritual or too abstract. So it can't possibly happen this way. And that's why you have people saying, well, no, because there's water in baptism, this is a completely physical thing. Therefore, you can't be baptized with the spirit with water. So therefore, you have to have two baptisms, one with spirit, one with water. Because they're trying to go way, way too far into reason or, or uh, um, empiricism. Um, experiential, I would say Pentecostals, but that's also a very broad spectrum. Pentecostals are kind of everywhere, or almost everywhere. But what they're what a lot of Pentecostal churches and congregations try to do is they really emphasize you have to have this experience. And some of them will actually say, uh, if you have not had a conversion experience, or if you have not felt that the Holy Spirit has come upon you and drawn you into the faith with whatever, then you're not actually a Christian. Uh, and sometimes that will be the speaking in tongues thing. Yeah. So that's why you can go too far experiential. Um, with scripture, KJVO, and that's also a very, very broad spectrum. Uh, KJVO is King James Version only. That the King James Version is an inspired translation. And if you use any other translation, then that is of the devil. <laughs> And again, but that's a very broad spectrum. Some people are King James only, but they say, well, I just prefer this because it has some of the some of the, some verses that the modern editions don't do because they're uh, more critical. But some of the King James only people, they're saying, no, this is the only way you can read scripture and you can never use any other Bible. And if you use any other Bible, you're a heretic. Uh, they, it was based on a group of theologians that yeah. agreed on the wording when they were translating it. It wasn't one sort of. Day, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, they make too much of a map. They make a mountain out of a molehill because usually when you're reading the preface to the to the KJV, yeah. you can see that the people who are translating it are very are being very humble, and they're saying, well. We may not have understood everything completely correct, but okay, so certain people say no, they're being humble, but really they they were inspired by God, so there were no absolutely no errors or mistakes, which is also very hard to defend because the King James only, uh, or sorry, the King James has gone through three major revisions yeah. within the first century that it was published. So no end to it. Yeah. <laughs> so for us as Lutherans, what we actually try to do is we try to basically maintain ourselves as close to the, the center as we possibly can. I would say that we're probably, uh, it's really hard to say, especially when you're going in four dimensions all at once. But I'd probably say maybe Lutheran would be over here. Because we do really like to emphasize uh, tradition. But we also like to emphasize reason and logic because we were one of the main uh, Lutheranism as a, as a denomination was really behind education in the faith. Um, Lutherans, well, I'll say European Lutherans and those who, who descend from European Lutherans, not so high in experiential, but if you go to say African Lutherans, they, they're more, they're a little bit down further there. It's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but you just don't want to go too far in any direction. But we claim to base everything on the scripture. Yes. Shouldn't we be higher up there on that? Oh, there. <laughs> in my opinion, I don't think. In my opinion, I don't think so. But that, but this would this would be my opinion. Like if you, if you grab somebody from another denomination, they're probably going to draw the chart a bit differently. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. We have two denominations. Yeah. But yeah, the goal would be to try and get as close to the middle, properly balancing everything as you go. Uh, not trying to be too far in one direction, but actually trying to honestly 
use what God has given us, whether that be scripture, our own sense of reason, um, the traditions, the, like the history of the people that he has given us, and also the experiences, because it is important to act actively engage in faith. Um, not necessarily receiving visions or anything, but uh, maintaining the faith. Uh, even within, say, the seminary, uh, the seminary in Edmonton, they very consciously made the entrance between the chapel and the library. So even though it's a seminary and it's an educational institution, part of the core element of faith is practice. So, you, so you're putting, at least at the seminary, in terms of uh, um, architectural layout, you're putting worship and reason on the same level. They're, they're, they're pretty much equal. Uh, in fact, within the past several years, Concordia Lutheran Seminary in Edmonton has been trying to make more way towards practical courses and try to introduce more practical courses rather than more academic courses because they want people more engaged in, in uh, dealing with the congregation. Um, yeah. So what church would you say is the closest to what was originally the early church of Christ? That's also very hard. <laughs> Because uh, because if if we do something like that, we might also get a whole bunch of axes all over the place. <laughs> um, because even though it's the historical Christian tradition, you there's still people. We're still people. <laughs> We're still people. Yeah. So there's uh, say somebody like um, uh, the Church Father Origen. He would probably be somewhere in that square with reason and experience. If you get somebody more like Augustine, he'd be scripture, tradition, and reason, not necessarily experience for him. And uh, uh, ooh, uh, Tertullian would actually be a good one. He would actually be uh, very much into scripture, and he'd probably go too far into scripture, but and forsaken uh, reason, and eventually Tertullian would forsake a bit of tradition. But uh, yeah. What about the 12 disciples? Well, that's the early church I was talking about. Yeah. Really good early church. And I mean, I, obviously, Thomas was an, uh, one of the experience. You know. I mean, yeah, so I would actually point them closer to the center, like the actual 12 disciples. Because um, even with Thomas, doubting Thomas, yeah. he's asking for something the other disciples already had. Awesome. Yeah, because they saw Jesus Christ, they're able to come up yeah. to him physically. So Thomas is saying, well, you doubted until just when you saw him, like uh, Peter and John saw the empty tomb and they were just, they were still confused. So Thomas was saying, no, I want to see him. I want to, I want to put my hand in his side. I want to touch the, the marks in his hands. What the same experience you already have. I know, yeah. But uh, even when Jesus, so we might think Thomas is way down in the experiential part. But as soon as Jesus shows up, we don't even have a record of Thomas going up to Christ. We just have him go, ah, oh, my Lord, my God, and, and falling down in worship right at that moment. So even though he's asking for experience, he's just kind of going with kind of the reason logic. If, if this guy is here, then of course he's God in the flesh. But they, there were people that did not recognize. Oh, yeah, uh, the, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And that, that was. Well, that was also the spirit. Was it your reasoning? Okay. No, no, no. Uh, yeah, in the text, it was uh, the spirit, the spirit hit, hid his identity from them. So it's only until uh, the breaking of bread that they recognized who he was. And that, there, then you go down to the experience with the actual activity in worship uh, with the Lord's Supper. And also with the beginning of tradition. Uh, oh, yeah, absolutely, yes. Well, actually, it was a continuation. Yeah. In continuation of tradition, because that was actually from the Passover, which was also recorded in scripture, and then so you back to the again. I know, yes. Because <laughs> if you if you also look at say all the apostles in their writings with or you or, or even their speeches, say in the book of Acts, or uh, they will be citing the old testament here, there, and everywhere. Um so yeah. But there's also a little bit of elements in tradition because if you read, say, the book of Jude, he references a couple of things that are not explicitly stated in scripture beforehand, but they were traditions within the community. Um, 
Jude is an interesting book. <laughs> I'll say that. Uh, what gets me is before people can discuss these things, they have to have read in the original, the New Testament, preferably the Old Testament. <laughs> that means by the time you have learned the two original languages plus your own and read all that, you are at least 50 years old. Right? Unless, unless you're incredibly intelligent. I'll, I'll, um, He's working. Philip Melanchthon, <laughs> he actually, he read, like he had his doctorate by, I, I think he was only 14. Oh. So, so he, yeah, he knew Greek, he knew well, he, well, I don't know if he actually knew Hebrew, yeah, but, uh, but he knew Greek, he knew Latin. But it's all relative to the time, right? Yeah. Latin, well, no, no, actually, yeah, no. It's he, relative to the time. So what we well, consider to be a PhD in the 21st century is very uh, different than at 14 in the... To give you some perspective, Luther, Luther got his about eight years older than Melanchthon, yeah. and Luther was also considered a genius of his time. Yeah. Yeah. So Melanchthon... Um, or the equivalent for us today of him getting a doctorate, but still be around age 14. Yeah, he was the, one of the leading Greek scholars of his day. But he got to focus just on that. He didn't have to do any housework or any cooking day. <laughs> like he, no, 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 fair he enough. Could so, yes. He could pretty much devote well, yeah. his entire time to learning. I think so, yeah. I don't remember him having to do too much, especially in his early life. Uh, to my knowledge, there is no high school in Canada that teaches Greek. Okay. So you have to teach university to do that, and then we also learn Hebrew as well. So, uh, Some Catholic ones might. I don't know. Well, I don't. Like I, I grew up with it too, right? It's not my school, but it wasn't. It, it hasn't been. Well, we had that in our grade, but it was a, a very small percentage of schools that taught them. Well, we taught, we had Latin, but um, yeah. as the the Latin professors aged out, like, they didn't have anybody um, to yeah, teach yeah, it. Yeah. So to get to it became optional. optional. Because the, the testament wasn't written in Latin, it was written in Greek. Yeah, so, I understand. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, it's yeah. it's um, quite a task to argue knowingly about the individual wording of certain phrases. That's what loves me. I get a lot of like about yeah, it means this, it means that. Well, 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, these words may have meant a little bit different, you know. So it's very hard to come down and say, This is it. You know? uh, well, as productive and interesting as the conversation is, unfortunately, I have to go upstairs and change. <laughs> but it gets interesting. <laughs> um, well, thank you for joining me. Thank you for let us um, close with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for bringing us together this morning for conversation and for study. We ask you, O Lord, for discernment as we go forward in the faith, uh, leading us to your word, to the faithful community, so that we may understand it correctly. And uh, just for the Spirit to guide our way so that we may experience it in our daily lives. Thank you, O Lord, for all of the gifts that you have given us, and help us put them to proper use. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.